Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer. My name is Dan, and this week's featured guest is Rob Tardic. Rob Tardic is a multi-award winning guitarist and contemporary pop, jazz, world fusion, instrumental music artist. His last six CDs have spawned multiple U.S. Billboard charting singles, two of which went to the top 10. Rob's awards include winning the 2018 Established Solo Music Instrumental Misuaga Arts Award, placing first in the 2017 International Acoustic Music Awards, and being the 2010 Canadian Smooth Jazz Guitarist of the Year. Rob's eighth multi-album release, Diversity, is available now. It is a four-volume compilation in all his various musical styles featuring new material and remastered songs from his past six recordings. His current radio charting single, Be Positive, is playing on stations worldwide and is available everywhere. You get your music, you can find him. Facebook.com forward slash Rob Tardick. That's R-O-B. T-A-R-D-I-K. Twitter, Rob Tardick. Instagram, Rob Tardick. And of course, at robtardick.com. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, Dan, I really appreciate um, this opportunity, this moment to share together today. So uh, much thanks to you, my friend. Absolutely. So Rob, to get us started off, could you maybe tell us about a piece of music you've heard in the past couple of days that really stood out to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you have to make me think about it. Last couple of days, or weeks, or weeks. Um, um, well, what I what I did see, yeah, what um, about two? Let's say two weeks ago, I um, I recently moved um here, but we're still getting settled in. April first, we moved with me and my wife. Um, so during the move, I found an old DVD. From I think about 2008, it was um, a David Foster um, special, and as you know, David Foster is a uh, just an incredible producer, arranger, writer, musician. You know, one of the top, top like Quincy Jones level. We're talking, mm. you know, we're talking one of the top of the. Um, and I found this video. Uh, it was a DVD and audio, so I was listening to the audio. I put it in my stereo. I go, oh man, I, I for- totally forgot about that. And he's produced, you name it. You know, I mean, obviously the stars, Celine Dion, Michael Bublé, um, Josh Groban, the list goes on. I'm, I'm forgetting uh, many, many, many superstars. And um, and I forgot I've never li- and I've had this for years. And I met my wife in 2011. We've been together 10 year now, 10 year anniversary. So she never saw this because I found it. I got this in 2008. So I I said, you know, hon, I go, we were settling down. We was tired. And I said, you know, what, let's put it on the DVD. Because I actually hooked up my old DVD Blu-ray player because it was a it was a DVD disc. I don't even think it was a Blu-ray back then, 2008. And I said, you know what? I remember watching it, and she never saw it. And I we always like to watch music and listen to music together, obviously, because musician. And I said, you got to check. And I remember watching that. And it, you know, and fast forward, we watched the video two weeks ago. I was blown away by it was like a two-hour special. David Foster and Friends, and like I said, I have probably haven't watched it since 2008 or nine. <laughs> and um, the music is timeless, you know. Um, the, the the arrangements, the quality of the the, the quality of the artistry um, is is just phenomenal. Um, especially the it, it was definitely a vocal uh, heavy evening performance, you know. Um, whereas I come more from an instrumental background of you know that type of technique and show musicianship from a, an instrumental uh, category where I'm not, vocals are not my first, although I do sing and I have some vocals on my tracks. Um, I hire other vocals singing, but that was the one for me, David Foster and Friends um, audio and just blown away. I highly recommend it. If you, if you want to get just demolished, <laughs> you know, seeing singers, like pure singers, you know, no auto-tune, no studio effects, no, you know, and I'm not trying to, you know, I, I, I live this and I breathe music. Um, so I'm very aware of what goes the inner workings of how music is created these days in anywhere from pop and hip hop and my genre of contemporary jazz and funk and R&B. Um, that's, that's some, that's some real heavy, heavy, heavy players and production, but the artistic talent you cannot deny. Um, I think it's interesting that you say, you're not a vocalist because the way you play the guitar, especially within your genre, 
is very vocal, especially when you're doing sort of what we might think of as the head or the melody of a lot of your songs, the embellishments and things that come around the melody are very vocal. Um, I was thank talking to, noticing. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I'll say thank you. You're the first person. I think that's one of the first interviews I've ever, I've ever had somebody notice that. Um, so thank you for that. That's a really actually a nice compliment because that is actually definitely true. Um, and just to elaborate, yeah, a hundred percent. I write, um, I write songs from a vocal point. I hum, um, I have, you know, my phone, I have multiple phones in my desk here. I have, you know, I have an old Blackberries <laughs> here, you know, and I can show, I got like old phones. I got, I got, what's this one I have here? This is like a Blackberry. No way. Really like Blackberry, Blackberry classic. Maybe. And it's brand new, still in the box. Like I have all my old phones. I'm kind of OCD. I keep boxes and especially with music gear, just in case. Oh, me too. Um, Always. I got my Blackberry Priv. And, but then I went now to um, my Samsung Galaxy, but whatever. The point is, I got voice notes. I use the voice recorder all the time. It's become my main go-to. Before, you know, I'm going to, I'm showing my age here, but I have all this out of hand's reach because I'm always writing and recording music. So this is what I used to use. <laughs> Some people might never seen these before. You're a young fan. This is like a little cassette voice recorder. You know what I mean? So it has those like those little micro um, micro cassettes like this, like a mini cassette. Right. So, yeah, back. So back when I was writing songs in the 90s and 2000s, I was using this to record a lot of vocal and song ideas. I would play my guitar and record it there. And then, you know, phone technology got pretty good and I was using the voice notes. So to answer your question in a nutshell, because I go off on tangents, so I'll apologize ahead of that. Um, the I always sing into my phone. I'm singing into my phone always, and I go back and I listen to those little bits of me going, whatever it is, and I'll go, oh, that melody, that is lame. Oh, that sucks. But then I'll go, there's something there. There's a little gem. There's something, there's an idea. There's a seed somewhere in there that can turn into a melody that I can sing and translate it to the instrument, my guitar. So, um, but whereas, you know, and I'll be honest, the genre that I'm in or this type of genre sometimes, um, because of my music is very diverse, that's the whole diversity project. We'll talk about that. But um, if I look at the specific genre, the one guilty thing of, say, smooth jazz sometimes or contemporary sometimes is the melodies are not developed. It doesn't come from a vocal standpoint. It comes from a rhythmic, like a groove. So they'll yeah. just get a beat and then they'll kind of just meander, whether it's a sax part or a guitar or a piano, they kind of just jam over like a beat. So it's not really constructed like traditionally like a song. Like I, I come up with an intro, I come up with a verse, there's a pre-chorus, a bridge, a refrain. You know what I mean? I write my songs just like you said, uh, like a, a vocalist, and especially from the second, third album on. You know what I mean? Um, the only place I might have done my first album, I had a couple a couple of, um, I had some songs that had a groove and I kind of jammed, but even those, I had a distinct melody. So melody, melody, melody for me is everything in a song. Um, the hook, the phrase, and to build a song, like I like a good verse, I like a good pre-chorus, you know. And um, so, thank you for noticing that, because that's actually one of the first people who ever said that. Uh, listen to my songs, because it's true. I, I I write that way, so your insight is great. Thank you. I think it's interesting too to look at the way, from a genre perspective, the smooth jazz songs tend to be constructed, like you're saying, with these sort of rhythmic moments where the whole band is getting behind generally some sort of syncopated thing within yep. the within the melody, and that's that's sort of a hallmark of the genre. And I can understand from a songwriting and production standpoint how it would be very easy to get sort of lost. And that so it's very interesting to hear how you really make melody first and foremost and then when you're building everything out do you produce your own songs or do you bring in producers to work with you generally every song that i've ever done i've co-produced or 100 percent okay so i'm i'm involved in every every track on my six well eight eight albums now with a lot of the new music so yeah i'm involved in every step of the way from seed to marketing to every way either 100 percent or at least 50 percent. so in general, can we s perhaps distill the songwriting process that you have to uh, melody creation, um, melody refinement, 
putting that melody into a DAW digital audio workstation, and then creating a demo around that that you would then make a final production around. Yeah, a lot of times, or even not even that, um, how do I put, um, even that structure. Like I said, for me, I, I, I use my um, the phone a lot, uh. and I really iron out the songs in my playing. You know what I mean? I'll really iron out the parts. Like, I'll take a seed. I don't know if what I listen to on my phone is a verse, is a chorus, is a bridge, but I will figure it out. Uh. Because I, at, in that moment, um, I've gotten out of bed in the middle of the night and just had an idea, like, you know, I've had several instances where I hear actual song, like I'm literally playing something on my guitar or hearing a melody in my brain and I'm going and my brain registers. This is not actually a, a cover song. It's not like I'm hearing a, you know, a, a, a hook from a, you know, whatever, some pop song from Maroon 5. It's like this is an original melody I'm hearing in my bed. And I'll literally I've jumped out, like, say, it usually happens early in the morning, like five, six o'clock. I don't know if that's when I'm in my REM state. <laughs> I, don't know if I get out. I'm not an expert on that, but I've literally jumped out of bed and startled my wife and I'll get up and I, I grab my phone and I'll be like, just, and I go in the bathroom, I shut the door and I'm like, da, 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 da. And I'm trying to get that melody, save it. And then I go back to bed. So that's happened before. So it's not always a structure to answer your question. It's not actually, I sit down at the computer and I'm charting right out. Now there is a time that comes and I do that. Like when before the record in pre-production, what we call this is all pre-production. Then I am, um, you know, the earliest stage of pre-production is literally me just looking at my phone or something in my mind. I still might have a riff or something, a rhythm in my hand. I massage it, massage it, massage it. And then I write out a chart. I'll write out a basic sketch of the melody, a handwrite. I'm still old school. I'll write it out. Although, you know, I could use the Sibelius or the program, but I find I'm just faster sometimes just writing out a quick chord chart mm. on paper. I sketch it out for myself and then I kind of refine work on that. And then when I'm finally bringing it to the studio for the recording session, we'll firm up that arrangement. And then, but it's never concrete because there's always beautiful magic that happens in the moment in the studio where I'll have a chord progression or a chord or a melody that we evolve. And maybe somebody just by accident plays something wrong and I'll go, oh, hey, I actually like that. That actually sounds cool where you took the melody, like you jumped up an octave or you harmonized that melody, you know, a third or a sixth higher, or you just phrased it differently. Like, oh, I, you know, and that's where collaboration becomes, which is so important in music as well. I think an so, interesting part of this process, Rob, is that when you are writing in your moments of creation you're getting these snippets you're getting these pieces and then you have this whole separate part of your process where you're going back and revisiting these pieces and like uh, some sort of uh it's almost like you're working in a dawn you're kind of shifting things around but you're yes. you have you have this one piece here you don't know if it's a verse you don't know if it's a pre-course you don't know if it's a chorus you don't know if it's a bridge you don't know what it might be an outro right. might be an intro who knows yes. and that sort of second process of discovery is really interesting because you're not constrained by lyrics you can transpose right. so you're not constrained by key you could do right. uh shift in meters which is not super typical i hear it every once in a while like in smooth jazz sometimes you have intros in an odd meter or implying an odd meter and then you get into the groove of the song but yeah. it, it's very interesting that you have these open-ended abilities to mix and match your ideas in a way that yes. maybe a lyric writer might not but i can see a comparison for that as well so talking yes. about your your music let's talk a little bit about your new single be positive can you talk yes. if you don't mind a little bit about what inspired the song for listeners who don't know yeah it's um yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna i'll try to it's, it's there's no you know there's, not, there's no easy way to you know or, or i don't know like, i'll try to play that you know i'll say it as best i can because it's a very emotional song for me um what happened was um uh, last summer, uh, my wife went out for a walk, uh, right in our home here in, in the suburb of Toronto, Canada, a really nice middle upper class area, I guess you'd call it. I don't know. It's just a nice area suburb, like suburbs are everywhere. You know what I mean? They're just homes, people living their lives, mowing their grass and, you know, going to work, doing their thing. Um, I, I, I like the suburbs because it's quieter. We live downtown. I found it was a little bit anxiety and stress provoking for me when, when I try to come home because of my nature, my work, when I tour and travel and perform, I'm in a lot of anxiety and very dense places, meeting people, crowds. When I come home, I don't want that. I don't want to be in a busy city. And I love the city, don't get me wrong, to visit and to perform, but to live. So we were in the suburbs, she went for a walk, and um, she never came home. Um, she left around 8 o'clock at night. Uh, by 10 o'clock, 
I was in a panic. I, I know she would never leave. It was dark, pitch black. It was July 28th, last year, 2020. Um, and what had happened, the, by the grace of divine insurance, Lord blessing, whatever you believe in, um, they found her. She was attacked and left for dead in a creek. Um, left for, yeah, like somebody, yeah, it was she just an evil, good and evil kind of collided is the best I can say. Um, you know, and uh, so what happened was they airlifted her after four cardiac arrests. She passed, she literally passed away four times, came back to life crazy story it's like one of those it's like out of a horror movie <laughs> um for lack of a better word and uh without getting to all the crazy details but they transferred by orange it's called here in toronto it's called orange air um is the chopper service for traumatic injuries people who are gunshots in life and death situations so they fly them directly to uh we have two trauma centers in toronto two hospitals that can handle uh this type of trauma to the human body and they took her to st mike's which is where i was born actually <laughs> And uh, I, I didn't, didn't even know that at first. But anyway, by the time I got to the hospital in the afternoon, after being in shock and finding out and being interviewed by the police, because um, in this type of scenario, the funny thing is uh, the husband's the first suspect. Mm -hmm. um, so I was held back by the police for hours for questioning. I couldn't even go to the hospital. They wouldn't allow me. They said, you know, it's just the nature of the way the, you know, the investigation goes. Finally, I got to the hospital and then I was just a barrage. And it was during COVID, of course, this is all going over last summer. I was the only one they let in as the husband's spouse. And I just got hit by a barrage of questions like, what's her allergies or any medication she's on? You know, what is her status? And, and then they said, and she lost tons of blood. Like I said, she's literally hanging on by a thread of a thread to life. And um, they said, what's her blood type? She lost a lot of blood. We need to do transfusion. And I was in that moment. I had no idea what her, I blanked. I, I did not know my wife's blood type, like a lot of, and I didn't, I came to realize after the fact that a lot of people don't even know their own blood type or their spouse. I know my own, I'm O negative, but you know, it's just one of those weird things. In the 10 years we're together, I never came up in karma that like, hey, what's your, what's your blood type? For? And I don't even think she knew her blood type, <laughs> you know, going back to it. Anyway, that night, and I was, I was in the hospital waiting room there. They put me in a room and I was like, just broken down completely. I didn't know if she was going to live or die. It wasn't looking good at all. Uh, but anyway, a nurse came back later on. They said uh, they had put her into induced coma, but they said, listen, your wife's blood type is B positive. And I was like, of course it is. And I started crying because my wife is positive. She's just pure light and energy and we balance each other that way. And um, she's just one of those people who lights up a room, you know, those rare, you know, you'll go to a party, you'll meet somebody who right away you just go like, okay, this is those rare entities. I've only met a handful in my life who kind of just you know, right away, they have a warm, welcome, genuine light that is shining through them. And that's my wife. And um, it wasn't her time. That's all I say. You know, she had a lot more to give back and um, that she has given back so much. I think to all the blessings and thoughts and prayers and from literally the, the whole country that was coming in. It was crazy. Even the world it was crazy. It was national news here it was on the cover of the paper twice, even the third time where they had to ban her from being on the front of the cover because just for this security and integrity of the case. Um, for privacy reasons, but uh, that's how be positive. So I'm, I'm looking at my chest on the camera <laughs> right here. <laughs> so for um, our listeners who are on audio, you're wearing a shirt that has a B plus on it, and that's B positive. Yeah, and that's hashtag B positive. Hashtag um, this is the male B positive. One. Yeah, and we have a female and a male version. And um, so uh, I wrote a song like at that time in the hospital, even in my back of my mind, I said, you know, we're going to get through this. I was trying, I was staying positive for her. She, I know she'd want me to do this. She would do the same for me. And by the way, so two months later, she was a month in the ICU and then a month in brain rehab for all the traumatic injuries. Um, so we got home in the fall, like October after being two months, like all of, all of August and September. And then, um, we finally got home and we needed a month or two to settle in, you know, and a lot of visitors and people wanting to find out what's going on and stuff. And it's caring. The community came together in, in incredible ways. Um, even during a pandemic, we managed to not having people over, but I'm saying just leaving gifts of food on the front and flowers and just on the front porch. We'd have like every day people would just ring a bell and there'd be um, mac and cheese there. There'd be like a cheesecake. There'd be flowers. There'd be, yeah, like all sorts of people just but, like and literally hundreds and hundreds. It, it went on till um, this year. It went on till about January, February this year. It just wow. continued. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it struck the community so hard because we live in such a nice community and the women they didn't catch this evil entity for two weeks 
and the whole community, women wouldn't leave the house. They wouldn't allow, allow their daughters to go for a walk. They, you know, it was crazy, right? People just were afraid to leave their home, which is not the world we live in. You know, a woman should be allowed to walk out of her house and go for a walk, go for a jog and not have to worry about, you know, this type of just a lightning strike of, of evil, you know what I mean? But anyway, um, that's what Be Positive by. I wrote a song. Uh, I called some uh, good, close, dear friends of mine in my band in um, mid-November. And I was already starting to record it. It was really hard during COVID because the studios where we recorded was shutting down. And uh, I finally managed to put it together from uh, seven. It took seven studios to put that song together and the other and some of the other new material on Diversity Volume um, 2, which is the contemporary funky jazz one. Because everything was closed, I, I would work from home. I did the guitars all here. I record all the guitars here. But this is mostly a guitar studio. I can do guitar and I play bass. So... But um, I don't have the mics for vocals. I'm not set up to do drums. Plus, I lived somewhere else. And again, that studio was more of a guitar bass. You know what I mean? Um, you know, like if I want to do a podcast or teaching, I do a lot of teaching for the colleges of music here. So my, all these doors are being shut. And, like, and they're all friends of mine. They said, Rob, we can't have you in COVID. We're restricted. Toronto's locked down. I was like, oh, I tried another guy. No, it's locked down. We can't do it. So I ended up going to Vancouver to do the horns. I did... Um, some horns in Toronto, isolated. I did the bass in LA. I did the saxophone in Los Angeles. <laughs> so um, just flying the tracks back and forth. So it took a lot, little bit longer than, uh, well, maybe a lot longer, I have to say. But they came together. Dave Cause is um, a multi multiple 12-time, 13-time Grammy-nominated saxophone player from the U.S. Um, in contemporary jazz. Um, he was the... He's been following. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. We've, uh, we've played together before. Um, back on my sixth album, we did a big show together here in Toronto. I reached out to him. He said he's all in. My bandmates, Curtis Freeman on bass, Davor Jordanowski, a good engineer and producer friend of mine, and a fantastic musician on keys. Um, I had Tony Moore from L.A. on drums. And then, um, like I said, there was another bass player who played on another track from L.A. And then I had a great friend of mine, Rob DeBoer, produce like not produce engineer it because i couldn't get into the final mixing and mastering i did that together with rob so we like i said i'm always in there 50 percent. the other 50 percent is an engineer usually somebody who's has the gear we mix it and master it together or we send it out for mastering and that's be positive it's a great song and we did a great video for it and we just had a, a charity five kilometer walk to raise money um because if you can believe it um it's hard like my wife just completed her master's before she was attacked but she hadn't defended the thesis. So during that time in the hospital, I received word from the university that it was such a groundbreaking master's thesis that they wanted to, um, she, she, whatever, she, they said, you don't even have to defend it. You don't have to do that. But it wasn't out of, um, because of what happened to her. They said, it's just a stellar piece. And they're, they're actually going to nominate it for an award here. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, for a master's thesis. One of the best they've ever, because... It was, it's on basically in a nutshell, it's on the use of synchronous and asynchronous video in job interviewing for students and for huh. people's careers. And this is all before COVID, before video. This is all going on years before doing research of how everything's going towards, as you know, a, a young person as well. It's like a lot of jobs are starting to interview on video. And this is like we're talking 2016, 2017, 2018. COVID's not even on a blip. So this is not a COVID thing. She was studying her master's. It took her four years. She was working on this from pretty 2016, 17 started it to now. She defended it two months after out of the hospital. She was out of the hospital in November. She defended her thesis, which was everybody was just awestruck. What had happened to her, the you know, what injury she had to even be able to defend the thesis after all the neurological. It's um, a testament to how amazing she was. So this Be Positive campaign, the university had dedicated a scholarship in her name, which is amazing to have something like that happen. And it's going to be for women, uh, inclusivity and help uh, women studying gender-based violence. And so, you know what I mean? Um, it's a wonderful honor to have a scholarship in her name at a university. And uh, we raised so much, um, oh my God, we, we, <laughs> we quadrupled or five times the, the, the amount that we were trying to raise. So now we can have multiple young women study um, undergraduates. It's amazing. So what has the response been to the song you you've had a very successful career you've had top 10 billboard songs um what's been different with this release to past releases um i think there's been a 
you know, if it's if I backtrack one thing in terms of the actual release itself, you know, not even just focusing it ideally on be positive. Uh, it's it is immaturity, I think, for me as an artist. I've and I've listened back. Funny enough, we were just talking about my wife. We were having to name that tune. Name one of my tunes. I was trying to stump her. I was saying like, okay, I was saying is this song is this one of my songs? Flow, fracture, reflections, and she was saying, you know, I mean, I was trying to stump her. She was, and she got it every time. So I didn't really. I go, honey, you really know them all my music. <laughs> Probably like a hundred songs. You you got every single one of them. First. I didn't think she would actually. <laughs> um, we're just playing name that tune. Um, anyway, I think it's the maturity I've noticed because even just talking to her last night when I was conjuring up the, those titles of some of the earlier ones, I was like, man, okay, that song. If I listen to today, what music I'm producing and how I'm recording it, there's been such a maturity, not just in technology. Obviously, that's a given technology from 2005 when I did Without Words, my first album, to you know now Diversity to 2021 and the two more projects I've left. Obviously, technology has, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a given. We're not on 486 computers or whatever those old things were. The, you know, what I, mean? I remember people bragging to me, man, I got I got two um two megs i'm up to four megs of memory <laughs> on my computer right you know like these ridiculous numbers you know what i mean um and when uh i get sidetracked but i remember playing video games when i grew up in the atari 2600 and ColecoVision and in television those video games had like 2k of memory 4k <laughs> of memory 8k you know what i mean yeah like seriously like, you laugh but that's what it was in ColecoVision, which was one of the that had 32k and that was like playing donkey kong and all these games and I still to this day I found it amazing what they could pull out of 32k, you know what I mean, of memory. Oh, for sure, all those old games like on the SNES and stuff, and even the NES. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. I'm, an, I'm a Nintendo kid, so like even oh, playing yeah. those old Mario, the like original Donkey Kongs, yes. A Link to the Past. Those yeah. are big games. They're hard yeah. games, and they're they're on this teeny teeny tiny little bit of memory. It's wild. That's so, so yeah, you know, I don't, I don't understand, but I was, I was wondering like, how do they cram all these, I used to play Pitfall, I used to love that game, there was a game called Pitfall, about this guy is like a safari journey guy, and I actually beat that game. Oh, congratulations. Uh, I, yeah, it was really good, but I, and I always thought the graphics were pretty good, I go, man, like, even by today's, these games are like, I don't even know how they, anyway, I'm getting off track, I like games too, and I'm like, I'm, kudos to those guys, like, these guys today have like, big terabytes and terabytes or whatever, you know what I mean, to write games, but. Give credit to those guys who are playing those early stages of games. You know, what I mean, even when before Sega Genesis, the first Sega Genesis. You know, um, that's pretty funny. Anyway, um, it's just the maturity for me. I think, uh, moreover than anything, I can see in myself my whole writing process. Um, technology aside, it, it's matured a lot. The way I approach songs, the way, like you said, we can extrapolate. Um, when I'm songwriting, if I'm writing a vocal tune, you know, what I mean, the way I'm now developing lyrics is very different than. You know what I mean? Or earlier lyrics I have. Um, or even if it's melodies and courses and chord progressions now, I draw a lot upon, as a teacher, my, my theoretical knowledge. Um, I can draw upon a lot more than I did then, just, just from understanding harmony and the way mm. melody and harmony interact and having a very strong theoretical background, being an educator and a teacher now, I can draw upon those things. And that all translates into the songs, um, which allows me to create kind of like more on the fly. You know, so I can create a lot of stuff in my brain and I can already hear it on the guitar. So mm. when I approach the guitar. Uh, I couldn't do that, you know, earlier. I wasn't, uh, I really needed to get in there and jam on things and kind of goof around for a long time until something. Now it's just my, my approach to music writing and arranging has grown. And then in terms of, you know, that it's translated into this, you know, the Be Positive song, the way it's, it's, it came about as well. You know, it's, that's the biggest thing I think for me, just that maturity and growth. So, As Rob, where where can we get uh, Be Positive t-shirts, and what do the Be Positive t-shirts support when we buy them? Oh, very good. So, you can get them. The best place to get them is on my, um, what we can do is I can actually send you a link. If yeah, you want. we'll put it in the show notes. Yep. You put it in the show notes, because I, I don't have access. It's on my computer, but it's, well, so, in a nutshell, uh, it goes to, it's a scholarship. It's um, in my wife's name at the university where she got her master's from and because of what she went through um they did they um and what she's been doing to help gender-based violence and help young women uh, to thrive and become resilient you know that's what this is a testament about her resilience and how we need to be resilient through this pandemic we've learned to become resilient and how to how to thrive and live a life um a quality life and not 
buy into the fears, you know, the media fears us a lot and fuels us a lot of stuff and false narratives and everybody's, you know, there's a lot of opinions going on, but a lot of times they're not based on fact. You know what I mean? It's not science. It's just, everybody's got an opinion, you know, and some people just live off those opinions and they start sharing those opinions thinking they're truths, but it's like, it's an opinion. It's not actually science fact. And I'm blessed to have a doctor uh, for a brother who really, he can bring me down to the ground right away and say, listen, <laughs> and my brother's the coolest guy on the planet, but he's a doctor and he's very noted and he brings oh, perspective to everything. That's fantastic. So w if anyone's interested in supporting the uh, scholarship fund, there's going to be links. If you're on YouTube, it's in the description. Yeah. If you're on audio, it's in the show notes. Label clearly. Um, if you yeah. feel so moved to support, um, that's where you Thanks. can do it. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about uh, diversity. So diversity is a mix of new material and remastering previously yeah. recorded songs. So why did you want to make this melange, if you will, of these two different worlds, this new world, new content, and then going back and remastering? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not remixing. You're not re-recording. You're just taking the mixed file and going back and just polishing it up in the mastering yes. process yeah just mastering we just yeah we didn't um we there was a couple songs actually i did go back and remix a little bit there was some issues with some of the songs i huh. think there was one song yeah it's not out that one's coming up on volume four there was a song um there's just a few like two or three i can mm. think of i had to one song actually the ending was chopped off for some reason on somewhere i didn't even realize what happened i think we you know, you miss something. <laughs> We're humans, right? So yeah. in the editing process, I, I didn't put a fade on. Um, uh. right? Yeah, you know what I mean? A sudden, sudden song just like hit a wall at three, <laughs> whatever, 42. And it's like, <laughs> going, what, the, what the heck happened to that tune? <laughs> that one snuck by us. Like that one literally got by me. Oh, boy. And, uh, so I had to remix and just add, the, let the song fade out. Fade, yeah. Write a passage off my uh, moments album. Anyway. Um. I didn't want to, the diversity, first of all, th that word is really something that, you know, yeah, if you look back on my CDs, they're always a positive message. I always try to elevate, if I said my purpose here is to elevate, move people, give something back, um, limitless moments, balance, energy, laughter, love, synergy, um, diversity, you know what I mean? I'm trying to give back the world that what I want, my positive attitude and create music that's hopeful positive, engaging, but still realistic. I'm not living in some facade world that life is always, every day is positive. And one but thing I would add there is that a lot of times, lyrically, the content of your songs, it's focused on love, acceptance, living life, enjoying life, yes. just yes. just living in love and living in positivity. Yeah, yeah, living, like, like looking for moments and not things. You yes. know what I mean? It's yep. like, we're collecting that's i love that saying we, we, if you live your life collecting moments as opposed to always collecting things mm. you live a more um it's, it's a more enriched life it's a more mm. balanced we're always trying to balance our lives and we're never balanced that we're always trying we don't get enough sleep or exercise or family time or whatever um we're constantly struggling with that balance you know what i mean and create good energy and laughter and love that's my life mantra bell ringing that bell of life as much as we can so diversity is like it really just um if I'm going to, I was going to do a best of, I said, my music has always been so diverse. My last, the sixth album was Synergy, which was showing, I had a lot of styles on that music. I wanted to show people like on a Rob Tardick record, you're going to hear contemporary funky jazz. You'll hear Latin styles. You might hear offshoots of little flamenco. You'll hear, um, you know, like funk. You'll hear rock. You know what I mean? You'll hear a little crazy shred kind of guitar. Um, I have a lot of stylistically, I'm kind of a jack of all, I can play a lot of different styles of music very comfortably, which is again, a testament to myself and my studies and my approach. So diversity is just that it's, and it's plus the world, you know, acceptance, you know what I mean? Um, we live in a, we live in a small world, but it's a big world at the same time and accepting others, um, just getting together, being, a, you know, we're all human beings. We're all trying to live our lives day by day, doing the best we can. My music is about acceptance and being positive and hopeful and, and accept, embracing all styles of music, just like we embrace all human in, humans as individuals. Everybody's got a story. Everybody deserves to have their story heard and to talk and have a voice and not be shut down, not be through whatever it might be. Right. Um, so the diversity, that's the concept, the, the main theme behind it. And then of course, tying with my diverse music and to be honest, I didn't want to reshuffle the deck and just say, I'm just going to create a best of like a lot of people release a best of, 
it's just they just reshuffle it and stuff like that. And you know what I mean? I said, you know what? I'm going to add some new music to every. Mm. I'm going to do four. I'm going to do four best ofs because, and the reason for four volumes is because again, my music is so diverse on purpose because I have a lot of interest. I just don't like rock. I'm not just a, a jazz guy. I love flamenco. I, I started on classical guitar. I love the blues. I love shred, crazy, pyrotechnical, crazy rock. You know, whatever. Pyrotechnical, like- <laughs> crazy rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like these guys are just sheer virtuosos, and it's like math, math metal. Like it's just, you know, there's not the emotion is maybe out of it, but you listen to it, and it's just virtuo. You know, it's like a virtuoso, like Paganini in the days of classical music, a violinist who was they thought he was, you know, possessed by the devil because he played. You know, that literally back then, you know, there was oh, yeah. believe, witch, witches and they burned people at the stake. And Paganini was literally, you know, had death threats against him. The music he was playing was very, uh, you're considered dissonant and atonal and he was the devil in, in, in music. And using certain intervals like the tritone, which is labeled the devil in music. And, um, you know, um, so I like all sorts of music. I embrace it all. And that's diversity for you. And my music uh, is very synergistic, just like we are synergistic of atoms and energy and you know what i mean um everything is synergy you think about it right it's you know we're we're synergy. life is a band is a synergy of different instruments coming together and, and diversity is the way you embrace it you embrace it all and bring it in and say listen we all have our differences we all have our stories but this is amazing it's a, and um so i had a good idea i'm not gonna get i got off i get off on tangents i'm the worst because I, I love i love to talk and um i had some such good ideas for reality shows to show that everybody's got a story. I thought, you know, you could take a camera crew and literally drop to, you just go into neighborhoods and lock on the doors and ask people, we're here with this show, tell us your story. That's huh. it. For 30 minutes, tell us your story. And it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? I think every door you'd knock on, even on the street you'd live, you'd be amazed at the yeah. stories you'd hear. That You have no idea your neighbor, well, my father was a war veteran or my mom was, uh, you know what I mean? You'd be like, oh my God, I never knew that. You know what I mean? Like, And I'd love that. I love the realism. Obviously, you'd have to get permission for people to tell the story. Some people say, shut the door and no thank you. But I think it'd be a cool, that'd be that'd be a reality show I'd really like to watch. You know, it's just like, get a camera crew, you literally knock on somebody's door in the moment and see if they're, and the people who are willing, come in their kitchen. You don't make it long, it's 30 minutes. In 30 minutes or an hour, let tell us your story of your family. And that, it'd be interesting. Anyway. Well, Rob, we're, we're at the perfect point in history right now because you don't need to pitch to execs. You don't need you don't need no. to go to NBC <laughs> or CBS or anything like that. <laughs> you literally can go ahead, print out some release forms, take a little yeah. camera and go <laughs> knock on people's doors. <laughs> yeah. And call it. Tell us your story. You know, I, honestly, I'm telling you here, but that's I thought it would give be a great show. I'd watch that because it's so people are so fascinating until you get to know them. You know what I mean? And uh, some people are more like an open book. Other people are very closed in. But anyway, I have off my tan. That's diversity. It's just a, it's a, a synergy of all my music with some new songs. Yes, there's some songs that have been few, few have been remixed, remastered. Yes, everything's been, like you said, freshened up, given that little sparkle with mm. the technology, because whatever I mastered in 2005 and 7 and 9 and 11 and 12, I kind of did every two years. My albums kind of have like a two year pattern. They all, a lot of them needed a little touch of that fairy dust stuff. Uh, you know, because the software has changed so much, as, as you probably know better than me. Like my engineer, that's why I count on him. He get every of the latest plug in, and yeah. you know, that's his world. He'll tell me, "You got to hear this latest thing from this and this." Oh my god, <laughs> this, this is gonna make the kick drum sound like this. It's like, oh wow, awesome! I just play guitar and teach. That's <laughs> what I do. perform. You know what I mean? I'm not a the mad engineering scientist. That's why I, I pay guys money to do that. Everybody got their specialty, right? So, um, yeah. That's so Raj diversity. We have. Oh, and I uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just and the last reason was the four volumes. The reason for four, four volumes is because when I'm playing a lot of concerts, a lot of fans would come up to me and say they would hear songs live and they would say, "Oh, we really love the Latin songs." What albums contain the Latin songs? And I would say, "Well, they all do. Like every every album has two or three maybe Latin songs or more. You know what I mean?" Or which songs has the funky stuff on it? Which mm. one has the kind of like the finger style acoustic? We really like the finger style acoustic guitar. I say, well, you know what? Each of them have bits. That's the whole thing of my, that's the way I do. I give you a little touch of everything because I have so many styles. I'll give you finger style acoustic, funky jazz. I wrote a hard rock, like a Joe Satriani song on some CDs, you know what I mean? Because I like that style. Um, I, I even did release a rock album last year and that I never even promoted. So I have that one. We didn't even talk about that one. That's for another time. Um, so I divided them into 
Uh, the first one was wintertime. I said smooth and chill. Stuff to, you know, you're inside the house, just stuff to relax to chill music. You know, people like to chill sometimes. Then for the summer, like I released the contemporary funky jazz, really upbeat songs, more high energy. The next one comes out in late summer, fall is Nylon Fusion, which mm. is all nylon songs. It's all Latin. Every single song. There, there's no funky jazz on that one. There's no chill tunes. And just to and clarify now, for listeners, when you're saying nylon songs, you're playing on a nylon string guitar. I'm, yes, sorry. Yes, I'm playing on a, They're all nylon string guitars, whereas the other ones could be electric, could be acoustic, steel, whatever. That one's strictly nylon fusion. It's Latin, high energy nylon songs. And the fourth one is for guitar aficionados, where I'm taking more of my for guitar players, my finger style, uh, my fusion tunes. I have some songs that are really crazy fusion, like 10 million notes happening in a song and modes. And I really, uh, I use my teacher's edge and I, I write it on purpose to be really, to appease the guitar player guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I have songs that appease my mom. You know what I mean? Like I wrote songs for my parents. I wrote songs for my wife. Um, but I've wrote song, written songs specifically, like, okay, I'm going to get one for the guitar players now. So they, you know what I mean? Um, I try to balance, to have something for everybody. It, you know, it's, it's, you know, so you get a little bit of, it might not be a full album of crazy rock guitar, but there'll be tidbits of it and, uh, until the day I can actually, you know, do that. So that's what the best of now you can actually have chill tunes, double CD, then the double chill of funky jazz mm. and then the nylon and the will be single CDs and uh, they'll be just all. That's the four volumes. And they'll be easier now when people come up to me at a concert. They'll say, I really like the nylon. Oh, here. There you volume go. three. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I really like the, the, the smooth and I like that nice melodic songs with the vocals. Oh, volume one. There, vocal. Good. You know, I like the funky stuff. Volume two. It'd be so easy. Cause Perfect. <laughs> that's honest. That was one of my rationale too. Cause I'm like, oh my God, I can never. It's, I, I used to tell people, well, you have to buy all at that time six albums because they, they all got that stuff on. I can't choose one that has just the nylon string songs. Or, anyway, I'm done. <laughs> so, Rob, I think it's very interesting that you you have your own label. Are you releasing yes. through your own label? Now, this is a little bit of a technical question. We'll break it down sure. if we need to for our listeners. But oh, yeah. are you getting distribution through someone else or are you running your own distribution? I'm happy to talk about this. I actually have, um, I actually have a course that I'm going to be teaching online. It's called The Entrepreneur. Um, I call it instead of the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, and my wife and I came up with that name. I've taught it several times live at master classes. I, I have a big teaching, you know, background education. Um, I love teaching. That's when I'm not performing, especially with COVID, I'm teaching now. That's what I do with digital streams, but I'm not performing live. Um, so for me, I guitardic is always just a play. My last name is Tardic and the guitar. So the T-A-R worked for both the guitar and Tardic. Um, that's my license plate. My wife got me for her birthday. Guitardic is my label. It's all my own music. My, um, but I have distribution through uh, the Orchard right now in CDI. Yes. So I actually have distribution through a legitimate. Orchard is actually a very large um, distributor. It used to be with Naxos, which was a classical jazz. Well, very classical. Naxos is probably the world's largest distributor of classical music um, and jazz and world. So that's when we're, I used to be in their category. Um, but we parted way. It was a amical relationship 2012 i was with naxos for eight years before i was with believe music um yeah i think and there's i know there's cd baby there's tune core there's you know um, a lot of the indies the do it yourself the diy kind of labels and um i started off my first album was on that um but it was picked up by um i had a friend still to this day who we've got universal records um tom mccurcher and he ran the jazz uh the classical or the jazz label i'm forgetting right now and he's the one who put me in touch with some labels and then I got signed. Um, but I own all my music. I highly recommend if I'm going to leave something today. Um, it's not for everybody, but if you can, if you have the means, you know, keep your music, keep the rights to your own music. Um, distributorship, of course, you need distributing. You need aggregators, you need the digital stores like Pandora and Spotify. And of course, and you can't be on those by yourself. You need to be tied into a distributor. You know, Rob Tardick, just like you, no one can individually release the music through iTunes. You need to be, go through a, a, an, an aggregator, you know, and, um, so for me, it's the orchard and um, that's the way I run things. But keep your music. Oh, man, I want to tell that to everybody as much as you can um, today because it's a streaming world and the revenue stream has dropped so much. You know, if I I'm very transparent, I tell people in 2011 and 12 when we had to switch over to singles. So people were kind of cherry picking, you know, what they liked off an album. You didn't have to buy an album anymore, right? The CDs were kind of done. Now it's like iTunes came out. It's like, oh, you know what? I like the hit. 
from this band. I'm only going to buy that one. Meanwhile, the band's saying, you know, we got other like seven, eight, nine songs now that are actually great, but people never even heard them. That's the only problem, right? Album. It wasn't an album world. It was a single driven. Um, but then if you own your own music, I'm telling people right now, I was earning about 60 cents for every download. It was a 99 cent, you know, up until a few years ago, you paid 99 cents per song. You wanted a song, 99 cents. When you own your own music, I was getting about 60 cents, 55 to 60 cents of that was going into my pocket in 2011, 12, 13. And then the shift started happening. You know, the labels and everybody, you know, I, I, I could do a whole seminar to our seminars, educate people what to do the right way if you can, if you have the means to do it. Um, because when you get tied into a label and they control everything, and they so that's 60, that's 60 cents is going to go down to one cent, two cents, three yeah. cents. You know, you're you're signing your money away literally to the label. You get the marketing machine if you're maybe the big artist, but for the general smaller artists, middle of range like myself, you get lost in the deck and you're gonna make nothing from streaming. You will have you can't live on it. You'll need another job. You'll need a side hustle. Oh, for sure. But I think it's important to recognize, however, that there is an economic reality that when a record label makes the makes a record with an artist, they are taking the financial risk. They're putting the money out there. And for that reason, they through our capitalist society, then they're, they they do their best to recoup their spending on that and then hopefully 100%. make some money to then be able to support more artists. But I, th I think it, a really interesting point here, Rob, is that you have your own label, but you're going through the Orchard, which is Sony's essentially sort of indie platform. They Sony yep. the Orchard does music, it does video. Uh, you yeah. see a lot of movies are put out that are more sort of indie style things. But the advantage for artists of doing that is, like you say, you get to keep control of your music, but then you, if you have that, ma you essentially have major distribution, you will get put on, and independent artists can do this themselves, but you'll get put on Vivo. You get put yeah. in a situation where you can chart on Billboard, because if yes. you're pure indie, trying to chart on Billboard is a nightmare, and oftentimes you're boxed out by the big players. Um, yeah. So I think you found a really interesting and very smart balance in terms of maintaining artistic control, maintaining uh, the ownership of your music, but then also being able to tap into the advantages that come from having that major distribution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You said it correctly. Yeah. And it, it took a while. I made mistakes. You know, I didn't know that always. I've learned and that's why I started kind of telling you know, online, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm planning to do more of this to help educate young artists and musicians mm. who don't know, um, you know, even the performing societies you have to belong to, you know, you know are oh, you yeah. part of ASCAP, are you I mean, part of ASCAP, yeah. Sound Exchange, you name it. There's so many, right? Yeah. Well, you have to register for ASCAP or BMI. That's going to yes. get your U.S. royalties. Then you need to do sound exchange yes. to get your international royalties. Then if you're going to have videos, you need to register with Harry Fox. <laughs> and the yes. list just goes on, goes on and, and on and on. It's overwhelming. It Still to this really day for is. Me. Yeah, it's overwhelming. And like even just moving now, I haven't even sent some of them my new address. My new, you know what I mean? Like I got to yeah. do that. Yeah. Or checks, kind of, because some of them still sell checks, if you can believe it. Yep. Some is direct deposit quarterly because you get your royalties. You know what I mean? So, um yeah, there's the odd one like sound exchange still sending me checks because mm -hmm. i'm in canada they don't send they don't do i don't have the because i'm that's one of the limitations that it's not a limitation it's just a little bit of a pain i'd say um some of them like you said are because they're u.s based like sound exchange they they i can't i don't have an inter i have an access a bank account they can deposit to through the through the country so they still send me checks so it's like sometimes they get lost in the mail or they come like two months late i'm going what's this check? i got one recently from sound exchange wasn't much, a couple hundred bucks, but I'm thinking, what's this for? Oh my God, this is for like last December. <laughs> oh, like, where's my March? <laughs> where's my, Mar you know, where's my March statement? I thought like December I'm just getting now. It's like, anyway, but, um, but I, 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 that's what I was just saying. So if you, if you want to take a crack at this business, uh, um, you know, it, it's very challenging. I wouldn't discourage anybody. Like if this is your passion, go for it. But, you know, maybe listen to, you know I me. Mean? Um, people like yourself, you seem very knowledgeable. You'd be a great contact. You probably already do this, a great resource. Um, listen to people who are succeeding or having good resource. You know what I mean? Um, that's the way you learn through education. You know, honestly, like education, education, education. Like that is the way in life. If you are foregoing that, 
and feeding yourself junk food on social media or video, you know, you're missing out. Just like I just educated myself, you know what I mean? on a lot of this stuff. And I learned, and that's where, like you said, I made those smart decisions because I was making mistakes before, or like I wasn't even aware of Harry Fox, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. What are all these different organizations? What does that even mean? And many people, I, I still talk to young people. They have no idea. They, they don't even know what this is. So they haven't done the research. They haven't educated themselves. You know what I mean? You can watch all your shit, TikToks and videos and everything like it, but that's not going to help you. You know what I mean? Uh, you, you really... You need to educate yourself. That's all I'm saying. If you really want to make, it's the business side of it. You have to get educated as an entrepreneur. It's like, as much as we love to record songs and I love to play guitar, it's the business side. And sometimes, trust me, uh, organizing metadata is, is boring as, as boring. It's like data entry. You know, uh -huh. when I was, when I was changing distributorships, I had to change distributors because I ended in 2020 to go to the orchard and they needed every single album, every metadata, every uh, song, like, you know, and, and there's column after column of that entry. I mean, like, you're literally filling out spreadsheets in, spreadsheets. Yeah, in exactly. uh, numbers or yes. in sheets or in something. You're literally working in a spreadsheet, which is not <laughs> what any of us signed no. up for when we picked up an instrument or decided to get into music, yeah, but so, it just comes with the territory. So, you know, and it's, a, it, that's my bane when I, when I knew <laughs> I had that pro, I was telling my wife, I go, you know what? I have to, I'm changing distributors and the only thing I'm regretting is I got to, because I own my own music, you know, you got to do that. If you're on a big label, yeah, they take care of all that stuff for, I'm sure like Justin Bieber's maybe oh, never no. even had a, he's never filled in a spreadsheet of uh -uh. metadata. He probably doesn't even know what it is when you do your own music. Yeah. And especially for me, when I had like eight albums now to oh, metadata, I was like, oh my God, I got to go back and what's the time of that song? I you gotta know the time, time codes and everything. It, <laughs> you know what it, I mean? It's everything? a nightmare. Yeah, but but you learn and it's cool. Like I know how to, like I said, I know how to do from seed to final tune, and I've learned all through mistakes. And uh, I'm I'm a true you do it yourself. But the distributorship is important. Yes, um, uh, you know you can use TuneCore, CD Baby, and stuff to get started, um, and then build up to. You know, what I mean, I think having some of the more, um, uh, I don't even know. I don't. I don't want to go down that conversation. It can. You could. You could stay with CDV all you want. It'll be. It's. It's fine or two. You know what I mean? They. They're. They're providing. Distro kid. Sort of, yeah. Distro kid is another one. Yeah. Of course. I never use them. Um. They're all good. They're all yeah. doing, and they help get your music out there. And um, yeah. And good luck to everybody on this. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a journey. That's for sure. Roadless one. So let's move into our rapid fire questions. Let's talk about lifestyle, practice, creativity, and songwriting. Uh, so I'll shoot these out and you just shoot them right back. So okay. how many hours do you like to sleep at night and how do you find that sleep impacts your ability to perform and creativity? It's everything. Sleep is everything. Uh, right now with COVID, I'm sleeping the most I've ever had in my life. Uh, let me just quickly ascertain your question. Eight hours I'm probably getting now consistently. I'm getting eight hours, seven, eight hours of sleep. I'm getting consistently now. Um, I find that fun I function well with seven, eight hours of sleep. Um, and I don't, yeah, great. COVID has been good for that. <laughs> Have you ever tried using mindfulness or meditation to impact creativity or performance? Um, I would say before performance or anything in that aspect, no, but I am like right now, my wife, she's reading the Buddha brain. Um, Rick Hansen can't recommend how much that guy's changed my life. That author writing, writing great books, check him out. One, it's one little thing is his book. And that talks exactly about that mindfulness. Uh, I, I in the hospital. I was really doing a lot of meditating when I was going through my wife and mindfulness and trying to stay in the moment, um, you know, helping heal my body, breathing, so I do that a lot at home. Um, I have not done much of that, like say before a gig, you know what I mean? And that kind of thing. But the breathing I'm, I, I find has really been it's amazing. Just breathing, controlling your breathing. Yeah. Do you exercise? And if so, how do you feel that exercise impacts creativity and performance? Again, it's 100% must in life, you know, sleep and exercise and a diet. I live a healthy lifestyle. I exercise pretty much every day of my life. I've done so since I'm a teenager. Um, I'm so blessed that my 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 children do the same. I you kind of, you kind of lead by example. Mm. So just by and I've never told once any of um, our sons to go to the gym. They all go by themselves, you know, and they love it. They're training. They're even part of their careers now. Is, is fitness and 
and, and training and investigations and policing. Mm. They love that aspect. And not one time did we ever say to them, hey, you need to get to the gym or you should exercise. They just, they see the parent doing it. You know what I mean? And it's, it's the culture. And it's the culture that I've created. With not even I've heard. I just, because they see dad's always exercising, always in shape. And he's trying to, not that I'm a bodybuilder, but I like to stay lean and in shape. And it affects my playing. My mindset is clear a lot of times. I'm human. I have bad days. Don't get me wrong. Or I have a, a pizza night or something like that. <laughs> the next like, oh, God. <laughs> Why did I do that to myself? But uh, I'm human. You know, I'll have my little junk cheat days, as they call them, right? You got to do it. Um, but health is wealth, man. My mom told me that. And she said it's cheesy, but bless her because it's absolute truth. And you're seeing it now with COVID that people, you know, I mean, you're trying to ruin your health. If you have some kind of a compromise system, you can see how it's affecting some people. You know what I mean? And it's, um, I'm not going to get into, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to start making statements here, but, uh, health is wealth, man. Health is wealth. Lot. It so, helps my music career tremendously. Indeed. With, my mind. with a wife with a family and being a musician, there, there's a certain friction there in terms of time, because if you don't practice, the first thing that goes out the window is technique. You know, second thing that goes out the window might be memory, different things like that. So how do people in your life support your ability to make music? That's a great question. This has been a great podcast. I have to tell you that right now just quickly. Um, I think you answer, you ask really good questions. Uh, it, it's definitely one of the top ones I've ever had in my life. So good for you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for asking the questions and not just generic, uh, sorry to say, questions that I've had, like, just like no research, nothing, you know what I mean? Just literally thoughtless questions. So this is great. Um, your family, again, your support, your network is, is imperative. Your family is your foundation, you know, and foundations and music will carry you through. Um, you know what I mean? You're building those foundations. Um, when I'm teaching students, foundations, foundations, foundations will carry you through more than any kind of fancy licks, mm. the YouTube junk food of just being able to jam songs by your favorite artists. But not even knowing what key you're in or what scale or what, what, what are you playing over? Like, like a parrot, you know, like a parrot can say a lot of words, but that doesn't understand anything it says. Many musicians, young people, especially now, you, they play like parrots. They just muscle memorize and play stuff. Now, obviously, imitation, muscle memory is important in development, but it's not only. There's mm. synergy, understanding, analysis, um, you know what I mean? Evaluation and creation all come at higher levels when you've studied and really understand things. So, so getting back to what you're saying the family aspect to me they allow me my i never have i have the best wife on the planet she encouraged me to practice she encouraged <laughs> me to, you know what i mean like no i i don't have any i'm i guess i'm I, i'm blessed i've had tremendous support um for my wife like a thousand thousand percent support never she would never hold me back from anything that i wanted to if i said i'm gonna go home and we'll practice and maybe we can watch a movie another time or you know what i mean um no, no, no. And we have that mutual respect. And my kids too, they know what I've done. I've, like I said, it's the culture I've, we've created here. We're all creatives. My wife is a creative as well. Um, she's writing her book right now. She's doing an online, online series, uh, her channel as well, Kimberly Black. little plug for her, KimberlyBlack.com or on YouTube. But, well, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes and in the uh, yeah, YouTube yeah, yeah. description if you're on YouTube. Yeah. So, so Rob, everything. when you guys first got together, did you ever have to have a conversation where you explained your lifestyle uh -huh. and where you guys talked about, you know, you're going to have these moments where you're going to wake up early in the morning or late at night, or you guys are going to be in the middle of dinner or something, and you're going to have to stop everything, grab a phone and record. Well, I mean, you don't have to, but you are most likely going to choose to stop everything and record whatever ideas in your head that you're going to need X number of hours a week instrument in hand where other things are not going to happen. Was that ever a conversation that you guys had? No, again, I'm, I'm just, I hit the jackpot there. Oh. Um, I've, I'll be honest, hundred percent honest. I've had that. I've had that problem before. Yeah. Um, uh, a previous, um, I haven't, I'll be honest. I haven't had that many relationships, but in, you know, there were, have been two in my life. Um, I had a definite problem. There was definitely, we were not on the same page. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes, yes, you can have a partner in life that wants you to put them 100% first all the time and kind of not respect your, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Your goals and, and yep. your, what you want to accomplish in life. And that, 
uh, you know, it's up to each individual how they're going to handle that. But it's uh, that's a challenge, and you might have to come to the harsh reality where you have to make a decision. You mm. know, what I mean, of do I stay with this person or do I move on? Now, this is a whole getting off on a relationship. But I, for me personally, with my wife Kim, uh, I I have no like not an iota, not not a molecule, not a grain of sand of issue with that at all. Um, and for me, it even goes further because I've been traveling. When I my, my I met my wife when I was in San Diego, on we met online on eHarmony. I'm happy to announce that. And um, I was in San Diego at a festival, and then I I, I was traveling before COVID. Like I, I'm I travel in the U.S. I have a U.S. visa. I have my O2 artist visa that I have, so I can perform in the U.S. and work in the U.S. legally. Um, I got to renew it right now. I haven't been able to use it the last year and a half to year. But anyway, another story. But anyway, we're all in the same boat. Um, so that is crucial. That is crucial for your mindset, your 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 uh, mental health. You know, to have a partner that is in sync with you, that understands, and vice versa for her. You know, what I mean, mm. if she needs to, my wife is on the computer and doing a lot of stuff, and she's teaching and doing courses. And, and I never, we never give each other any type of conflict. And hey, like, what about me? Or you know, I mm. kind of need or stuff like that. No, we and we save. And you know what it does? It makes you savor the moments when you're really together. We're really together. We go for a walk. We hold hands. We're looking at the side. We're not, you know what I mean? We're talking about the future or we're just drinking a Starbucks coffee together. And but we really you're, enjoy you're those moments. Yeah. Very present. You you're, know, you're in the moment. It really, it really brings up an interesting thing that, again, I'm not a licensed psychologist. So I'm not going to get too far into this. But like being good with yourself before you get yes. – a partner and before you with before you get into something serious for me just makes so much sense because it's like if you still have so much that you're working on for yourself and trying to figure figure yourself out and like not not having a read on your own insecurities your own biases all these different ticks that we all have if you don't have that level of introspection and you get into a relationship all that stuff is going to come out in the way you act with each other and I, I, I think, you know, you talked about at the beginning of this conversation, the maturity in the songwriting and the maturity in the recording process and how that has brought you to a new level of artistry. And I think we can make an immediate comparison to life that as you're more introspective and as you learn more about yourself, that can then bring you into the circles and open your eyes to new people that you maybe never would have seen before or never even considered before. Yeah, well, Dan, yeah, you should, yeah, you said it, Pert, that's a beautifully said, you know, eloquently, you, you know, you have a very uh, mature, great use of the, the vocabulary. <laughs> Com- I'm complimenting, I'm, I'm not as good, but um, my, my strengths come out in my music and other stuff, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not a, a writer, per se, but uh, very eloquently, very well put. And here's, what I, here's one thing I heard a long time ago, which is totally ties into that. And I've told my two sons this when they were getting as teenagers and starting to date, you know what I mean? And trying to find them, you know what mm. I mean? Like we're all very insecure. You know, you're trying as a guy, you're trying to establish your, your, that alphaness or well, mm. not even alpha, but you know what I mean? Just trying yeah. to stop your presence. You're trying to meet other, other people, individuals, whoever it may be, whatever. Right. So all I told my guys, I said, I said, you know what? I, I heard this and it stuck with me always in my life. Don't, Go looking for the right person. Be the right person, and that that's a hundred percent what you just said in a nutshell. You know what I mean? And that's what that is the pitfall and the downfall of many relationships. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, um, when you're not the right person in mind, body, and spirit, and growth and maturity. You know that's a very it's a very simple phrase, but it encompasses everything that you said. And we could definitely go into all the minutia and the details of being the right person. And then you're ready to self put yourself out there. When you're not that right person inside, you're not. You don't love and really, look, not to love yourself like oh my god, you know what I mean. But you're confident, and happy, and you love the person you are and what energy you're putting out. You're gonna have a lot of problems in relationships, and those things, like you said, are all gonna permeate. They're gonna these little red flags and these little things are gonna start popping up in the relationships. And yeah, it's not a good recipe. So I told my guys, don't go hunting for that right person. Everybody says, oh, I want to look for. The- I want to find that right girl or I want to find the right guy. I want to find the right. It's like, well, you know what? First be the right person for you, you know, mm. you know, be <laughs> don't looking for that person yet. Like, you know what I mean? Um, be the right person. So, and then you'll just find it. It'll come to you. 
So Rob, do you define yourself as a musician, a human who plays music, or something else? Uh, oh, that's a great question. I am a, I am a creative. Mm. First, well, first and foremost, I'm a creative soul. I've always mm. been. Uh, and I really, my my main goal, like I always say, with my music, is to move people in in a in a in a way that is meaningful to your life. Mm. You know, now you could be in a state of melancholy and sad, and you might find my music moves you. You know what I mean? Um, it doesn't always have to be, in, but it should move you somehow. Um, I'm hoping in a positive way. Um, ultimately, that's my. I know my purpose in life. I, I, you know, and that's tough to find. I know it's a lot for young people to find purpose and meaning in your life. That's the main thing you have to try to strive for. When you don't have that purpose and meaning to get up in life, it's, uh, ugh, I, I, that scares me. I'm so blessed that I found it when I was a teenager. You know, um, I'm sums up. If somebody says, "What kind of human are you?" I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a creative, uh, giving person who just wants to make people happy. That's all. That's the ultimate goal of my music. That's all I really want to do beyond monetary of course i need to live and pay but if i can put a smile on somebody's face and make them dance in their seat or get up and move um when i see little children at my show and i say this on the mic when i see little kids dancing at a concert whether it's an outside festival and i see little two-year-olds and they're like booging to my music that to me is my greatest achievement i say you know i go and i go on the mic and i say you know what i go I stop on the mic literally after the song and go, you know what? I've just been, my day is fulfilled. Um, whoever's daughter or son that was dancing, God bless them. Because they don't know if I'm Drake or Justin Bieber. They wouldn't tell the difference. But they knew that something moved them. They had mm. the initiative that they heard my music, not just, not anybody else. My, the song that I created was enough to take a two-year-old out of their seat and to start boogieing around. Or another and anybody of any age and for me that's my greatest i'm like that's awesome that's if i move one person to come up to me and say your music really touched me and moved me and and you know like i had i've had one couple who used, well actually more than once I, play, I used to play many weddings and people actually play my original music and one couple actually walked down the aisle to one of my songs oh and wow so, yeah so i was like yeah and i played at a funeral somebody asked me to play at their side it was the hardest gig of my life i was an 18 year old kid who I knew indirectly, the parents knew me, passed away, uh, suicide, just terrible. Just circumstances were great, but he loved guitar, and I, yeah, they had the guitar on the stand, and they asked me to play one of my songs in tribute uh, to him because they loved the song and they knew he would do guitar music, and I could barely keep it together. Like wow. I had, that was that was the hardest gig I ever had. I was crying, like, and I, I just couldn't stop. You know what I mean? And I'm in front of like there was must have been you know, uh, uh, but it moves people. Music is, you know, and um, it can really touch and move people in ways. And that's my ultimate. I guess that's my purpose here. <laughs> that's that's my, my my life purpose, what I've been put on this planet for. I'll continue so, doing that till the day I die. So shifting gears a little bit for what serves your purpose. Also, we're right about at time. Do you have a couple extra minutes, Rob? I'm good. All right, excellent. Good. Thank you. I, I appreciate you accommodating my computer issues and oh, my lack of <laughs> i'm telling on my schedule <laughs> it's been a crazy day uh like i said i lost a very close friend of mine yesterday to covid so, so kind of shook up that. my core yeah, yeah yeah thank you do you have a time or times of day that you prefer to practice uh yes for me afternoons and evenings are generally you know, my times to right now i would have to say especially with the pan pandemic being at home so much. But, um, afternoons and evenings are my time to focus at various times. You know, I can pick and choose because I'm mm. kind of self-employed. You know, I'm self-employed all my life pretty much. You know, um, those are my best times for me. Um, there has been some mornings, but I generally... But your, back your preferred time, the time that just feels good for you. Afternoon, it's really a, a, between afternoon and evening. Um, mornings, I'm usually exercising or, I'm, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm doing my life. Um, you know my own my own um stuff for my body yeah you know what i mean yep the human my, stuff. I, yeah i do that in the morning i find it works it just sets the rest of my day if i oh. hit the you know I, I bought one of these punching bags and kicking bags i like martial arts and 
I get up in the morning, I jump rope, um, I'll stretch. Uh, if I, if I don't, if I miss a morning or a day, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm upset with my, I'm like, man, damn it. You know, like Rob, come on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm 52, but I got to keep out. I'm, I care. I just got to keep rolling. I got to keep rolling. Yeah. Gotta you got to keep, gotta keep going, moving. Right? Yep. So about how many hours a day do you practice on average and about how many uh, days per week on average do you practice? That's a, that's a, today it's, it really varies. Um, some, sometimes I don't, I can't, I don't have time to practice zero, you know, mm. in a day. It, it, days get really busy and I have, I have days where I don't practice at all. Um, but I'm working on music. There's not a single day where I'm not working mm. on you, music. Every day I work on music for a long time, <laughs> whether sure. it's teaching. And but, I don't, I'm not even taking teaching. I don't count teaching as practicing, no, but I have not. a guitar in my hand. Yeah. Um, but I, I, te I teach four or five days out of the week, but I'm not even counting that. I, that I do all the time. I'm always teaching and playing and talking about music, but that's not my own personal yes. practicing time yes. where I have my guitar. So it varies some days zero because I just, I'm so busy and I'm wiped or we have other life things to come up. Um, other days I can practice for eight to 10 hours a day. Mm. Uh, I'm working on stuff. And I was, um, recently I went on a real big practicing kick. Now it's kind of come off because we had to move. So it's, you know, life changes. Um, I'm looking, to, I got one big music project I'm working on right now, but again, it's not practice. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working on some teaching pedagogy stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm doing a research study on, so, which is cool. It's very cool. So I'm, I'm definitely playing guitar, but I'm not practicing my own stuff. Um, so it really varies. I, I couldn't honestly tell you I do two hours strict a day. Um, you know, going back though, what I will tell my students, cause I teach the college, um, when I had that luxury when I was younger, when I was 15, 16, 17, 18 you know, living at home, I would practice every day, pretty much 99% of it, anywhere from two to 12 hours a day. Uh, yeah, when I was in my formidable years, and I tell students, if you're not putting in that time, you are not, your purpose might not be uh, a professional musician. Indeed. What is the maximum length of an effective practice session and for the just for the sake of argument um well not argument but for the sake of clarity calling let's say a t uh, technique practice like what's the most time you could sit down and focus because technique practice requires a lot of focus right so yes. that that's a very high high intensity high focus way of practicing what's the maximum amount of time that's effective for you uh before you sort of burn out and lose your ability to uh Keep it yeah. on the ball. Yeah. Well, these are great, great, great questions. We could do a, se a session on that because this is what I teach and I do master classes when I go to the colleges and, 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 the, and the retail outlets when I'm on tour. Um, a practice schedule when you you know when you grab you know I have everything beside me. I got a metronome beside me. I got my phone. I got my timing devices, backing tracks. I'm ready to go at any time within a hand's reach. I think I tell my students you can do honestly if you have anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes a day where you're where you're actually totally focused in the zone. You don't stop for sure. a drink or a washroom or get a sandwich. Um, but to, you know, like if you're in your familiar years though, like you're really developing technique per se, like if we're just talking about pure technique. Yeah. Pure um, technique. Yeah. Like I think 30 minutes to an hour a day would be a minimum, an absolute minimum. That and what's the require. maximum effective duration? You don't want to do too much because then, again, it's just human nature that you get sidetracked and you get mm -hmm. go off on tangents or whatever. So I honestly think like, like 30 minutes to an hour is solid. That's what I would recommend hmm. like as a, but you know, a two hour practice technique session, that's quite a bit. That's pretty, you got to be intense, but I've done that. I've done more than that. Sure. Um, depends on your, your outcomes and your goals. You know what uh. I mean? Like technique, technique is different than technical. You know what I mean? Like building technique, proper technique is just. Like if you're playing tennis, just learning how to hold the tennis racket and learning a le learning how to do a forehand and a backhand. That's not that you're not a virtuoso. That's not you're not Roger Federer. Or, you know what I mean? Like some you know amazing tennis player. Just like a guitar player, working on technique thirty minutes to an hour a day is just to build proper technique. You know, overall, you're working on your hammer ons, your pull off, your alternate picking, your hybrid picking, your finger style, left and right hand synchronization, stamina, endurance. You know what I mean? Like I do this for a living, so I can talk about this. 30 minutes to an hour, I think, is necessary minimum for students. If you're not doing that, you just pick up the guitar and noodle around for five, 10 minutes and stuff like, oh yeah, you know, maybe in per exercise that tells students, like if I'm doing, 
you know, I can even grab my guitar. Like I'll show like if I specifics. I'm not gonna so right now what we're talking about is how you segment or divide your practice time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you know, I'll, I can tell my students to grab. I'll go back a little bit. See, like if I'm doing just a straight, I do a, what's called the 24 digital pattern exercise for my students, and I tell them that the 20 there's 24 fing, there's 24 patterns between the human fingers. Right. Six so like one two three four one two four three. Exactly. Yeah. There's 24 combinations. So my one of my one of my five 10 minute a day drills for my students, I tell them absolutely they have to practice to develop the neurological connection. You know what I mean? Because your fingers have to connect. If there's 24 variations between four fingers, mm. if you actually exploit and actually practice those just for five minutes a day, 24 days of the month, not even you get five, six days off. You know what I mean? It's a 24 day cycle. You do that religiously. For a part of a year or two or three, your brain, it's like you have smart fingers. It's like, you know, these digital patterns get so enveloped in your brain. Because remember, it's mental speed we have to develop. Most students don't or focus on mental speed. They focus on technical speed. You know what I mean? Yeah, plus I think there's really something to be said that if you are to approach the instrument from, let's say, like a five pattern perspective. So five positions of pentatonics, five positions of blues, and then if you overlay everything else on top of that the only time you're going to run into any sort of stretch is when you're playing perhaps a harmonic minor melodic minor or some other sort of exotic scale otherwise everything else is within that one two three four four fret yeah. span mm -hmm. for everything mm -hmm. yeah. yeah but you can really but even to elaborate further i'll be honest with you, i could are or, or you but you can you can layer a pentatonic with a different <laughs> You see, right. I can play a pentatonic across oh, yes. three octaves as well. Sure. Right? So you can spread the notes out even if I'm playing an arpeggio. Oh, yeah. If I'm playing eight over A major. Right. So that's, that's, so that's a one octave within the shape. Yeah. But right. I could also go. Right. You see, there I spread that same A major seven out over, and it creates a different range in my hand, like a linear. Now I'm thinking linearly, right? And I'm thinking. Where the notes lie on the fretboard, I know there's a G sharp A, C sharp B, then I know the G sharp A, C sharp B, G sharp A, C sharp B. So I'm, it focuses me to learn my fretboard, really think where mm. the notes lie. Um, so I'm not just thinking of I got one pattern or like a pentatonic. Like you can you can take that same pentatonic pattern, and like you said, the five. Right. There's the other patterns, quote. You know what I mean? Sure. But it's also knowing the intervals. What's under your fingers? Like, what note is this? I'm hitting the flat seventh. You know what I mean? Here. Mm -hmm. So, where else can I find that flat seventh? You know what I mean? So, that's when I'm, and I want to target that note over. That's the note I want to target. I want to target that G because the flat seventh is a cool note. Mm. That's much more interesting than playing the root. That's a boring note. That's like vanilla ice cream with vanilla sprinkles. It's, there's no thing. There's nothing to augment the experience, but if I if I hit this flat seventh, or if I hit the sixth, the sixth is a cool note. Now it has to resolve, maybe down to the fifth, but or up to seven. Yeah, and then the seventh will resolve up to the tonic. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so that's just tension and release, and that's again guitar studies. But I'll focus on my students on those digital patterns. Sorry, I never I got off on a tangent. So it's like literally. You do today, little Johnny, you're working on, like we said, we're doing two, three, one, four, 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 two, three, one, four. And that's it. And for our, um, Rob, real quick, for our, uh, for audience who are, uh, audio only, um, yes. we're assigning, uh, numbers to the fingers on the left hand. The index finger on the left hand is one middle two ring three pinky four and so what rob is doing is he's calling out the order of the fingers he's using as he's using them playing progressively uh from yes. his low e through to his high e correct thank you yeah exactly i forgot I'm just, we're just speed speed drilling here but yeah absolutely i'm using my middle to my ring index pinky and then i'm transferring that through from the low string to the high string and I could do that on one string in whole steps. I can go like two, three, one, four, and then I shift up a whole tone, the lead finger being the middle finger, because I'm starting off on two this time, right? So it's two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three, one, four, two, three, one. Right? And, and you're you just going vertically up the, uh, well, horizontally, but thinking vertically in terms of going higher in pitch up the high E string there. So, yeah. So these are like five, 10 minutes a day of just one, one pattern. 
two, three, one, four going diagonally, two dimensional plane, because the guitar is a kind of a two dimensional plane instrument. Yes. So you can go vertically, you can go horizontally, you can go diagonally, ascending, descending. That's five, that five, 10 minutes will race by. And who knows? Like I said, I end up, you know, you could do those for like 30 minutes, an hour oh. easy. But I'm, I just tell people, like you said, technique. If you just, that's just one exercise. I have multitude exercises. Oh, so, sure. you know, if you do some of the exercises I'll give students for 30 minutes to an hour a day religiously, when you're in your developing, say, teenage or young years, whenever that may be, you know, you're really connecting a lot of things. Of course, that's not even counting all the theory, understanding triads and foundations of scales and intervals and, you know, all that. That's separate practice. That's practice too. So, um, you know, how much guitar overall do you practice a day? That's a different question. For technique, I'm just saying, 30 minutes to an hour would be great. Five, 10 minutes for exercise. So do you take any steps to stay creative in your day? Oh, another great question. Um, man, I think I love these questions. Uh, yes, I am always, I'm, it's just my nature. Uh, I comment uh, whenever I'm, I'm, it's just the way my brain is wired. I think, uh, you know, to really answer that question, I think it's just the way my brain is wired. Uh, I'm just in a creative mode all the time. I'm always, you know, my brain naturally goes to create ideas like inventions. You know, I'm on a, I'm an inventor too, right? I have a whole line of musical accessories. I, we don't even talk about that called the Music Stamp Series. Oh, um, well, can you mention that real quick? Yeah, sure. I'll just grab one of them for you. I've been doing this for 30 years. 30 years? More than 30 years. So, yeah, there's a lot to Rob Tart. We don't have time to talk about it. I'm, I'm just a creative individual. So, this is, uh, sorry. So these are self-inking stamps. You can see they have pictures of the fretboard. That's a six fret with a nut. And that's the same one with no nut. And what happens is in a nutshell, I'll just stamp it on my hand. Oh, I get so it. So this, this just, this is a self-inking stamp. And you stamp your hand and then you have a fretboard on your hand and you can draw out scales, arpeggios, triads for your students. So I invented this long time out of necessity when I was learning, when I was a little 15 year old Rob Tardic learning when I quote asked my teacher for the jazz chords and tetrads, because I didn't know what the jazz guys, I started on classical, then I got the rock bug, but then I wanted by 15, 16, like I said, I practiced for four, six, eight, 10, 12 hours a day while I was in high school. You know what I mean? Like, um, plus I got help and I was in a music program that really was amazing. That helped me give me a lot of time to practice music. Cause I was on a, kind of like a little mini scholarship within the high school for music. But anyway, um, uh, these stamps came by necessity. So I have a whole line, the music stamp series.com. There's over 30 models for pretty much every instrument from banjo, ukulele, bass, guitar, seven string, saxophone, flute, you name it. Um, and I've, I've been selling these, I call it money while I sleep these days. Um, I'm doing another distribution with a UK guy right now, but I've been selling these for over 30 years. I started in the wow. mid eighties before you were born. And, um, I took an idea that I got out of necessity because and here's the original one. <laughs> here's the funny thing people ask. Uh, here's so, the original. It started off just as a rubber stamp. This oh, is the very first go. music stamp from 1986, I think. So to break and down for our listeners who are audio only, what you have is you have a series of self inking stamps which are creating empty chord boxes, also called chord frames. And yes. then you have those for a variety of instruments and a variety of lengths. And then exactly. so for yes. your your sort of uh, studio private teacher who's maybe at a out of their basement or at a guitar center or wherever, yeah. they can take that stamp and just go shing shing on a piece of music or yes. uh, on, a, on a piece of staff paper or on a piece of blank paper. And all of a sudden you've got a chord box ready to go. You can write down yeah. chords, scales, anything. Whatever musical concept they need to notate huh. in person, and you're not leafing through a book trying to find it. Like that's what I love about the mental speed because it encourages people. Hey, I need a seven sharp five. Okay, let's write it out to the student. Here it is. This is mm. how it's voiced. Here are the intervals. I can show it. And I have all sizes. I have one that's like way bigger than this, so it's easier to draw on. This little one is specifically for musicians who are doing charts. This fits on manuscript paper, just like so you can do. Yeah. You're reading a jazz chart. You plug in a specific voicing that you want to maybe target, you know, because there's so many, there's thousands and thousands of voicings of chords. So, you know, you can customize your own chord grids. And again, I did this out of necessity because when my, my teacher uh, started drawing out diagrams for me, he, he just drew these by hand. And, I, and he, I, he gave me like seventh chords. And I remember going home and I couldn't read them. They were like so sloppy. I didn't know, is that dot on the G or is that on the B string? And I was making mistakes. And 
and I didn't have the knowledge, you know, I wasn't mm. figuring them out. And then I told, and then I went to the, the state, um, it's much like a staples. I went to a stationary store. It's called grand and toy it says here, grand and toy on it. And, um, I asked him, can you make me like a little wooden block? Like it's the frets of the guitar. They didn't even know what I was talking about. But I remember the guy at the staff, he goes, I don't even understand what you're talking about. But I drew him, I hand drew, I came with a drawing. I drew with a ruler and I said, I need you to make on a wooden block this, this diagram, please mm. for me. You know? And they did. It was expensive. Even back then, I remember it was like almost 30 or $40. Whoa. It wasn't cheap because it was a, it was a custom one-off. This is like in the mid eighties. Um, and today, you know, I sell the self inking because there's no extra stamp pad and makes a mess and you ink all over your hands with a, with an exposed ink pad. The self inking, it has a, it has a little protective case, keeps the ink dry. Um, you know, this is like fourth or fifth generation. I've gone through many models and, um, I sell those. Yeah, I, I sell those as well. So that's another part of my and um, another part of my business, my side. But it's actually, you know, um, it's slowed down a little bit with COVID because not as people, you know, teaching. But you know, it was part of my income. You know, it was it's it's it still is. It's a part of my income. I have a Diderio here in Canada distributes for me nationally in Canada. Oh wow. Um, yeah, a Diderio. I've been partnering with Diderio and Godin is my endorser for guitars. I've been with Godin guitars for twenty years. That's developing relationships, and I always tell students. When cause students and other players ask me, hey, man, I want an endorsement. I, how do I get a Diderio? I get like I just got this yesterday in the package. I got to do this. My homework. It came in the mail yesterday. These are actually brand new. Nobody's even seen these. If you've seen these, these are brand new. Never. You're the first person seeing them. Oh, whoa. Um, new strings. See, yeah, these are brand new um, Diderio strings that they're in the beta testing mode. And oh, I'm wow. one of their um, players. I beta tested the New York series for them. So I just I haven't even cracked it open. It's really nice packaging, right? Yeah, really, it's beautiful. It's I, nice I little, love it whole tab i haven't opened it because i'm gonna do a i almost opened it you see i started opening i go oh geez i want to make a video of you yeah like i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little youtube thing first i'm say hey just got the brand new deterio um sx they're called i don't even know like i said they're so new i don't even know what they're called they're sx now <laughs> they're, used to, they're used to be called like new york xls they had the new york series and uh these are new steel strings and these are for acoustics they have electric coming out and they just they handed them they sent uh you know, some of the players in Toronto, you know, the professional guitar players. And they said, would you please um, put these on the guitars, test them out and send us back your comments. So wow. I, I got a video next day or two. I'm going to I'm going to set that up. And then, oh, that's fun. Yeah. Diderio has been an amazing company. I can't say enough about those guys and, um, and, and gal. It's just great. And Godin handmade guitars here in Canada. And I was like 15 guitars here. You don't see. So <laughs> I don't want to show off because a lot of students. Uh, do you have, how many guitars do you have? I have, I have a lot of guitars. That's all I'll say. I don't need to try to do that. But, well, but they use, but they're my tools. I use them. You know what I mean? It's not like I have no guitars that hang in a plexiglass thing. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, no, I they're used. They're, they're beaten. Speaking of guitar collections, have you seen uh, Jim Peterick's guitar collection? Oh, now, do you know Jim Peterick? Uh, I know he, Jim. he was on the show a while ago. Yes, I remember seeing, I remember, that's right. I remember seeing that. I did, like I said, I went to your channel. I remember seeing Jim because he's got, a, I think his hair was purple. At yeah, time, purple right? hair. Yeah, I What saw a rock that. star. What a legend. He is a legend. You know, Eye of the Tiger, survived, you know what I mean? He, you know, and I met him. Um, yeah, I met him and we even emailed. We wanted to actually collab collaborate and write some songs at one time. We just lost track and touch with each other. But yeah, I met him. He's amazing. He's an amazing songwriter. And again, you know what I mean? A creative and uh, I met him first in Toronto, and then I met him again in Chicago. I think he was from the Chicago area at one point. I'm not sure where he's right now, but I, I think I met him in Chicago one time at a show as well. But anyway, yeah, Jim, funny guy, crazy. Yeah, he's a very unique individual. <laughs> such a talented guy, such a talented guy. So, Rob, those are all my questions for you. Do you have anything else you think we didn't cover that we should talk about before we call it a day? And that was a... Uh, that was time flew by, but I really enjoyed. I have to say, like honestly, kudos to you, uh, Dan. I really enjoyed um, this, you know, this best music podcast. I really like this, so um, I had to recommend um, people tune. And I'll have to you know, tell people this is pretty. I, I like the way you do it, and I like your articulation and that you're educated and um, eloquent and spoken. You know, um, so kudos to you, young man, because I, I you're just a young guy. I'm probably twice your age at least. Um, so. I, I value people who are educated and, and take the time to research things. And, you know what I mean? And just, you know, it's a testament to the youth of today. You know, you get some real bright. It makes the future's bright, you know, with you guys kind of hanging out there. And uh, so that's promising for me. I, I, love, I love seeing that. Um, uh, 
No, it's been wonderful. I just want people to, um, you know, uh, if anything, for the young people, like we talked about to young musicians, you know, find your path, you know, and it's it's a journey, you know, but find your purpose, even in not just in life, but in music, you know, find, um, be authentic, be authentic, you know, what I mean, like, whatever path you want to be in life, it doesn't matter even career wise, just be authentic in life. I think people more and more and more so today are craving authenticity. We live in a world where there's just so much, I don't know, called it clickbait and it's just the fake news. You know what I mean? Be authentic. I think people really are thirsting for that. They want real people who are real and uh, cause then it gives them purpose and it's like, you know what? Yeah. Like that person's real and the music they're creating is from the heart. It's not just to, you know, try to monetize and get, clicks and you know i was talking about that with my brother you know like he was off topic uh, you can edit all this stuff out i guess and uh, he was mentioning about science my brother's a doctor and he says when he sees uh, you know like in other scientists and doctors but they have channels where they're you know sometimes they're really monetizing things heavily or you know what i mean it's all about the likes and things. it's kind of like well what are your real purpose you know a, you know people who are actually studying science are not you know what i mean having youtube channels are trying to monetize everything and make money off it you know what i mean they're really trying to contribute to society and the betterment of human, whether it is human health and, you know, the wellness of others. So, you know, for me, again, that's what I think. I'm trying to be authentic. My music, every song has a story. Um, I think about the songs. I write them, the titles. So that will help you in your career, you know, and educate yourself, you know, be an entrepreneur, not just a, a, a guitarist. You know, being a guitarist is not enough to make it in music. You know, you have to be unless you score some big jackpot pop thing, I guess. But even then, every, every, you know, even if you sat down with the Justin Bieber, you know, he's a talented guy, you know, like he's, he plays multiple instruments. You know what I mean? Like he's had yeah, ups he, and downs in his life. He has but genuine he's, talent. Yep. He has genuine talent. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. many people will write him off, especially in the pop star world. Like, oh, they're just pop star. They're just figments mm -hmm. of the big labels and a write off for these guys. No, you know what? They all have a story. Some of them work really, really hard and went through ups and downs and, um, you know, and they're just amazing, you know, like, because uh, he's local, plus he's from Stratford. Uh, Justin Beaver is from Ontario, same province where I'm from. He's not far, maybe like a two hour drive. He was born. Um, Avril Levine was born in Nepean, about a three hour drive. Sean, uh, Sean Mendez is like 30 minute drive, not even 20 minute drive from my house in Pickering. We're in the same part of Toronto. We're in East Toronto suburbs. So it's Pickering and Ajax and Whitby where I live. So he's like literally a, a long bike ride or a 20 minute car ride. Um, totally talented kid, you know what I mean? Sings, plays the instrument, writes, you know, and I, I have so much appreciation for authenticity. You know, when, when you're in it for the right reasons, people will recognize that. Um, so, yeah, do the right thing, be authentic. Uh, I think a, uh, chance. we'll have to have you do a celebrity series of knocking on people's doors and you ask them to uh, <laughs> t tell them your story. Uh, Rob Tardix, current radio charting single Be Positive is playing on stations worldwide and is available everywhere you get your music. You can find him Facebook.com, Rob Tardick, that's R O B T A R D I K, Twitter, Rob Tardick, Instagram, Rob Tardick, YouTube, Rob Tardick, and of course at RobTardick.com. Thanks so much for coming on.